Down the slipway she goes. One of nine big liners being built in Britain today. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, watches as the Windsor Castle glides majestically into the waters of the Mersey to be fitted out for her maiden voyage. At Barrow in Furness, Princess Alexandra launches Oriana, whose powerful engines will speed up the passage from London to Australia by a whole week. And just 21 years after the Queen Elizabeth was launched by her mother, Princess Margaret launches the Royal Mail Line's new ship, Amazon, at Belfast. In a nearby berth, the largest new line of them all, the Canberra, is beginning to take shape. All these ships will still be in service in 1984, because these days it takes a quarter of a century before a passenger liner can really make a profit. These are the ships of tomorrow, and the shape of the ship is changing. The Holland America Line's Rotterdam, latest recruit on the Atlantic run, gives some idea of how the shape is changing. Her lines are unlike anything that has sailed before. And the biggest change of all is no funnels. Fumes from the exhaust of her engines go out through the derrick posts in the after part of the ship. Canberra's mighty walls reached up towards the sky, various kinds of exhaust outlets were tried before the outline of the ship was finally decided. The main consideration was, of course, to keep smoke and soot from blowing down on the decks. So one design after another was tested at the National Physical Laboratory. In this wind tunnel, every type of wind to be met at sea was reproduced. In the wave tank, the shape of the hull had already been tested and modifications made so that the ship would cut through the water with the least possible resistance and yet remain steady in all kinds of weather. Canberra will also be able to move like a crab sideways to help in docking her in smaller ports. Gone are the days when every ship was built piecemeal by riveting together individual plates on the stocks. Today, larger and larger units are prefabricated under cover and welded into place. Canberra's superstructure will be aluminium, and that'll be welded too. Although she is actually being built in Northern Ireland, parts of the ship are being made all over Britain. Kitchen equipment from Falkirk, electrical switchgear from Brighton, conveyors from Barry, anchors from Birmingham. Over a score of different towns have contributed something. More than 10,000 men have been working to create this 15 million pound ship. From Middlesex, the glass fibre lifeboats, one example of the use of new materials, arrive by a less modern form of transport. What other changes shall we see in tomorrow's ships? Setting the pace is John West, the 32-year-old architect of the Canberra. The main difference between Canberra and other large passenger liners is that her engines are down here at the after end. This means that the remainder of the ship is left clear for passenger accommodation space and also their public rooms. Up at the forward end, there is accommodation for the crew and below that, the cargo holds. The other visual difference is that the lifeboats are positioned down here instead of up in the usual position on the game's deck. Most new passenger liners will have just two kinds of accommodation. The first class will be more spacious and luxurious than ever. In the tourist class, where prices must be kept moderate, increased comfort is being provided by making better use of small space and using new materials. 
In Canberra, all cabins will be air-conditioned and have iced water on tap. But while Britain is building large passenger ships, the cargo carrying business has a less happy story to tell. So have the shipyards, where cancelled orders mean empty berths. Intense foreign competition has forced down cargo rates to an all-time low, and many owners have laid up their ships. What is going to happen here? Probably the least economical place for carrying cargo at high speed is the surface of the water. Nuclear power is too costly for private owners to use yet, but naval craft like the American submarine Skipjack have proved it to be practical. What navies do today, merchant fleets may copy tomorrow. It's more economical to travel fast underwater than on the surface. Perhaps some of tomorrow's cargo will go by huge submarines. More cargo, too, will go by air. This latest freighter carries three tons and is useful for short-haul commercial jobs since it doesn't need a long runway. The Army is finding it adaptable for many purposes as well. long-distance freight carrying, planes larger than any that have yet been seen must be built. Peter Macefield, whose company makes the biggest planes in Britain yet, dreams of airliners that will make today's giants look like pygmies. Well, you know, about 1970 or thereabouts, we shall have supersonic transport aircraft carrying 100 passengers or more, able to fly between London and New York in little more than two hours. And then on the cargo side, there's no doubt we shall have large cargo liners carrying 30 or 40 tons of freight, not quite so fast, but operating at fares and rates, which will be very much lower than anything in force today. Another contribution to the problem may be between air and sea. Something like the hovercraft, which skims the surface of the water. But ships will always have their place, and you can't beat a ship for this kind of thing. So in the shape of ships to come, lies the promise of a new era in ocean travel.